Uh, we started this symposium in the year 2001 to help provide an academic dimension to the commemoration of San Jacinto Day. And we felt that we needed to do this because we wanted to bring together some uh, outstanding scholars from around the state and the country to help educate the people of Houston <coughs> and Texas on the Battle of San Jacinto and some of the great events that happened uh, just before and after the battle so that people can understand better uh, the events uh, of the Texas Revolution, uh, which really is our creation story of Texas and is the foundation for what it really means to be a Texan today. It's so important for us uh, in our current generation to help preserve this story and to help interpret it with different perspectives uh, so that it becomes relevant and stays alive and interesting uh, during our 21st century. So that's why we do this. Uh, one of the most uh, remarkable things about our symposium is that it is done entirely by volunteers. We have a, a San Jacinto Symposium uh, Committee, uh, which does everything from uh, reserving this room to coordinating the lunch to coordinating the programs, the mailers that you receive, um, and all of the different logistics with uh, getting the speakers here and so forth. Uh, these, uh, the members of the committee are listed in your program. Uh, but I would like to recognize uh, Barbara Eves and Dave Britton, the co-chairs of the committee this year, for their outstanding work in making this possible. We have absolutely no, nobody is a paid staff person uh, that, that puts on this program. So it's really remarkable that we're able to do, do this uh, year in and year out on this basis. I'd also like, um, many of the members of the, of the committee are outside at the registration desk, but uh, if, you see their, if you see them here, be sure to thank them. Uh, because of their outstanding work. I'd also like to uh, mention our sponsors, uh, in particular the Summerlee Foundation of, in Dallas. Uh, we have here John Crane is here today. Uh, the Summerlee Foundation has done a tremendous amount of work and made a tremendous uh, great contributions to Texas history during its existence. Uh, they've shown great support for this event and we really couldn't do it without their support and we really appreciate everything that the Summerlee has done. Also this year, uh, we have a new partner, uh, Sterling Bank. Uh, they've produced this uh, very fine reproduction of Sam Houston's report of the Battle of San Jacinto. There's enough copies for everybody out in the back. Uh, anyway, this, this is uh, from Sterling Bank. Uh, be sure to pick up a copy. Uh, this is uh, a, an original copy of Sam Houston's report of the Battle of San Jacinto, which is in the Dallas Historical Society. Uh, they have an original copy, and Sterling Bank has reproduced this for us today. Um, also, I'd like to mention uh, the, uh, in your packet there is uh, an application and a flyer for the uh, Texas State Historical Association. And if you like uh, this program or this type of program, you're going to love being a member of the Texas State Historical Association because they do this on a much broader scale uh, with a very fine annual meeting each year. Uh, and we have here today Larry McNeil, who's the current president. Uh, we also have uh, several uh, former presidents, including two of our speakers are former presidents. Uh, it's a fine organization, and I encourage everyone to, uh, to join if you haven't already uh, joined. Uh, we also, uh, today, for the first time uh, during the history of our symposium, we have a certification from the State Board of Education for teachers, and we have a number of teachers in the audience here today for the first time. Uh, we really appreciate you coming, and uh, this is uh, part of our outreach to help uh, educate uh, not only you, but hopefully you'll get come away with some different perspectives on teaching our, our children today about Texas history and a great appreciation for it. Uh, I mentioned the teachers that are here today, and again, I want to thank you for coming. Um, also, um, uh, I mentioned before about the Friends of San Jacinto Battleground. This is a nonprofit 501c3 organization. Uh, we're performing a very important work in helping to preserve the battleground at San Jacinto and uh, we have information about joining that organization too that's in the, it's on the in the foyer uh, we have here today Jane Duvall who's president of the friends and uh, she'll be speaking at lunch and telling you a little bit more about the organization uh, we also uh, have a Houston media source here uh, they'll be videotaping this event uh, the prior symposiums have also been videotaped and they're available on DVD in case you're interested. Um, in addition, uh, on your, in your packets there is an evaluation form. Uh, looks like this. Uh, think about this evaluation form as you go through the program today. 
Uh, our responses are very important to help uh, fine tune and improve the program for in future years. Um, and uh, also uh, for parking, I, want, I need to make an announcement that you, you need to get a parking token before you leave, uh, and the tokens will be at the desk uh, out front as you leave. Um, finally, I, I just want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your day to come here. I think we've got a great program lined up, some really great speakers. And uh, with that, I'm going to uh, introduce our moderator, uh, Dr. James E. Crisp. He's professor of history at North Carolina State University. Um, he's making an encore uh, appearance here. He's been here for several years, and we're really happy to have him back. Uh, Dr. Crisp has uh, uh, made quite a name for himself in, in Texas history. Uh, his recent book, Sleuth in the Alamo, won the T.R. Fehrenbach Book Award yesterday in Galveston from the Texas Historical Commission very prestigious award. Um, we're very glad to have him back. He's going to introduce our speakers today and give us an overview of some of the issues that we're going to be discussing. Again, thank you very much for coming and patronizing our sixth annual Battle of San Jacinto Symposium. Jim? Thank you, Jeff. Can you hear me okay? Um, it really is an honor to be asked to come back here year after year after year. I, I sort of have made the statement to my folks back home that uh, if you schedule anything in April, I'm not going to be around. I'm going to be back in Houston, and it's really nice to be able to do this every year. Um, I used to come research uh, Texas history in July and August, and believe me, March and April are better. <laughs> <coughs> I'm not going to spend a great deal of time giving you the uh, educational background and bibliographies of our speakers, mainly because it would take up uh, a great deal of the time that we have allotted to us. Um, uh, the, the three speakers that you're going to hear this morning, uh, Don Felix, uh, Felix Almaraz uh, from UT San Antonio, John Jordan, uh, counselor from Atlanta, and uh, Jerry Drake from the General Land Office are each going to give us very different perspectives on what's going on in the Texas Revolution. Um, Dr. Almaraz did his uh, initial educational work at St. Mary's and got his PhD from the University of New Mexico. Uh, John Jordan is a graduate of Samford University in Alabama and Vanderbilt Law School. Uh, Jerry stayed home in Texas and did his work at one of two of my favorite places uh, because they've been so good to me in the past, and that's the University of North Texas. And something that I have to make my mind uh, really focused to say, and that's Texas State University at San Marcos. I'm still not quite used to that term. Uh, but uh, what really interests me about what we're going to hear today uh, is what they're going to say about the collision of different traditions, uh, the collision of different worlds, of different ways of thinking that take place during the revolution. And I'm not just talking about the military collision, but the collision of different political tra tra traditions, the uh, collision of different ways of thinking about not only civic and political activity, but also how you fight a war. Um, this afternoon, we'll be introduced to Andres Resendez and Archie McDonald. And I know in, in Andres's book about changing national identities on the frontier, one of the most interesting things that he talks about are the different discourses. And if I could just jump ahead for a moment and have you think about his book. He talks about something that we're not going to talk about this, this weekend called the Texian Santa Fe Expedition. And he looks at it from the perspective of the Anglos and the Anglo-Americans and the Anglo-Texans and how they talk about it and what discourse takes place about that. And then he looks at it from the perspective of Mexico, very different, where every Corillo has a newspaper. And the newspapers and the military are all talking about this almost as if they're from a parallel universe. And then in one of his most brilliant moves, he goes up and talks about the Kiowa, and he takes a, a cowhide, uh, one of these winter counts from the Kiowa Apaches, 
and shows that they ran into the Texan Santa Fe expedition too and that they saw it from their world. Well, what Dr. Almaraz is going to do is to talk about Santa Ana's pamphleteering background and the way he thought about pulling together political and military forces through the grand gesture, the, the political pamphlet. Uh, it's related to the tradition of the grito, the shout, or the plan, the plan. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a tradition which feeds directly into Mexican mobilization for the Texas, for putting down the Texas Revolution. This is a, it's a, it's a, it's a tradition that has to affect Santa Ana's uh, thinking as he goes into that war and perhaps we can think about what grand gesture did he have in mind politically as well as militarily as he thought about what he was going to do in that war. John Jordan is going to talk about a collision of traditions to a certain extent the way he does in his book uh, the Lone Star Navy. One of my favorite chapters and a real eye-opener is his chapter called General at the Helm. What happens when you put a general in charge of the Navy, and it was specifically Sam Houston? Uh, uh, a general who doesn't understand how navies work, how navies are put together, how navies have to be provisioned, how navies have to be kept intact, because unlike the militia tradition, you can't just pull these people together all of a sudden and send them out in the field. You've got to have them ready. And there's a collision of think, uh, w ways of thinking there. And uh, that we may see even some harbingers of that in his talk about what's going on in the Texas Revolution. Um, we were discussing a book, the author of which will remain unmentioned today at breakfast, uh, a book, a famous book about the Texas Revolution that doesn't talk about the Navy at all and doesn't talk about the Mexican retreat and the decision to retreat, which is bound up with whether or not the Gulf will be under the control of the rebels or of the Mexican government. It's central to the outcome of the Texas Revolution. Uh, and these are different worlds. Some universities even have a military history department and a naval history department. There's a little inter-service rivalry from time to time that comes out in something like this, and it means that one doesn't quite understand what the other's doing and how it works. And John is going to inform us uh, uh, about some of the dynamics that are going on in the Texas Revolution as two different ways of fighting intersect and interact and maybe collide themselves. Uh, and then Jerry Drake is gonna do that nitty gritty of getting down Sometimes there's a, there's a collision of worlds of historical thinking. You know, how do we tell the story of the Texas Revolution? Do we tell it in broad strokes, simplistic stro um, strokes of good and evil, of simple, okay, Houston retreated, Santa Ana went after him, then Houston jumped on him and surprised him? You know, it's, it's a great story, but when you start breaking it apart into its small pieces, you begin to get into that detail that resists final and definite analysis. What really happened, as the great historian Robin Collingwood of Oxford University said, that everyone who really gets into the history knows that nothing is really settled, that there are questions at the edges of almost every major issue that have to be investigated and argued and re-argued. What I tell my students at North Carolina State when they want to be historians is, is two things to remember. One is that every ball that gets thrown at you in history is a curveball. It's got aspects that you really don't quite expect and every historical question has to be taken fresh without as expecting to know what the answer is. And the other is that there aren't any answers in the back of the book. In other words, we can't go to the library and find out which of us is really right. Uh, there, all of us make an attempt to fit our narrative to the evidence. And we have to compare our narratives and see which ones best fit the evidence. We can't go back and say, okay, let's look 
at the real history and compare our narrative to that because we don't have it. There is no such thing as studying the past. The past is gone. We can't touch it. What we have to do is study the fragmentary remains of that past as they exist in the present. And what Jerry Drake is going to do is to talk about the nitty-gritty of getting his hands dirty, something that Greg Demick has talked about to us in the past, the nitty-gritty of getting his hands dirty and see if he can pull some of that past up out of the muck and compare it to what we thought happened and maybe, maybe inch us a little further towards an understanding of, of, the, of the realities of the Texas Revolution. So I'm going to quit talking now and let you hear about, uh, about these collisions of, wor of worlds, of historical thinking, of military thinking, of political thinking, uh, in exactly the reverse order to what I just gave. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chris. Can you hear me way back there in the Hallelujah Choir? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, pleased uh, and I'm honored uh, to be here at your symposium at, for the San Jacinto. We said that's the way we pronounce it in San Antonio, but I guess well, I'm over here. I'm a politician, so I'll have to say San Jacinto. <laughs> and I must remember that when I play Sam Houston. Uh, we are, uh, I am personally. Uh, uh, honored to um, have it, uh, here uh, a former student of mine, um, uh, Albert Rakus, and um, I always knew him as Albert Victor, but over here he has become just Albert uh, Rakus. And um, the Consul General of Spain, my friend, uh, Julio Montesino, uh, who heard about this conference, and then from back home, um, County Commissioner Tommy Atkinson. We have four county commissioners and a county judge. Um, three of them are historically literate. <laughs> and the, <laughs> but Tommy is the best. <laughs> so uh, thank you for, for coming, Tommy. Uh, the inspiration that is the idea for this presentation on Before Texas, uh, Genesis of Santa Ana as a pamphleteer um, came from uh, copies of pamphlets that are <coughs> located in the Sutro Library in San Francisco. A friend of mine, a Texan, uh, Dr. W. Michael Mathis, is the curator of the Colección Mexicana at the Sutro Library. And um, I was giving a paper, preparing to give a paper in San Antonio on Santa Ana and his generals. And he said, I have a lot of material over here at Sutro. I'll just uh, duplicate some and send them to you. So a lot of them were pamphlets. And uh, it caused me to rethink about uh, the pamphleteering tradition. Uh, I had always believed uh, from American history, my study, that, well, it began in North America with Samuel Adams and uh, how they used pamphlets in order to keep the momentum going but I didn't realize that it was much more extensive and, and there were some antecedents to this. Pamphleteering evolved as an inexpensive medium of literary expression or advertising. The chapbooks in English society began as pamphlets or small booklets of popular ballads or tales formally peddled al aloud or hawked by sales promoters who became known as old chaps. And they sold then their chapbooks from door to door. In the late 17th century and early 18th century, immigrant typesetters and peddlers conveyed the printed medium to British North America. In the second half of the 18th century, when relations between Parliament and the daughter colonies deteriorated into armed rebellion, pamphleteers typified by Samuel Adams compiled, printed, and disseminated information concerning the latest developments in the battlefield. Adams and his partisans maintained a relentless distribution of pamphlets via a network of local and county committees of correspondence and exchanges with intercolonial revolutionary camps. It was said that there were two factors of significance that aided the pamphleteers in their mission during the short span of 
the American Revolution, and one was the absence of mountainous barriers, and the other was the impressive degree of literacy among the readership. And for many years, that was taken as a, a fact of life, that uh, this was true for the American Revolution, but it wasn't true for another revolution that occurred later uh, in Mexico. Yes, there were the mountainous barriers, but the pamphleteers were working. They just didn't allow the barrier. It took a little longer, uh, but then uh, even the mail service today takes a little longer to get messages, you know, f from within a city. But I'm a traditionalist. I believe in the, in, in the postage stamps. Uh, I believe in keeping them busy. And uh, I know my friend Jim Tri uh, Crisp over here gets a little uh, annoyed with me because I don't, I don't use the email. Uh, but I do use the telephone. <laughs> and so I like the direct, uh, the direct communication. Well, Spain's history was influenced by e e waves of immigration and occupation. And they it, the, the literary tradition uh, developed there in uh, centers of urban uh, density. And notwithstanding the ominous shadow of the Inquisition, the literary splendor uh, attained its uh, zenith during the celebrated golden century of Spain, which really was only 90 years, but it's best to say a century, 1490 to uh, 1680. And while we're dealing with centu centuries, I, I can see there, there are quite a number of converts in this uh, audience. Um, when I reached uh, 50 years, I didn't send out an invitation to say, come to my 50th birthday. I, told, I invited them to come and help me celebrate my half centennial. <laughs> that was impressive. <clears throat> and uh, now and, uh, and there are those who say, well, I'm only 25. It's a quarter century. Uh, don't deal in years. Think in terms of the event and celebrate the event and forget the years. Well, in history, we can't, re can't ignore the years. We have to, that's, that's our bread and butter. Uh, when the movable type uh, became operational uh, between the 1455 and the year 1539, 40, a, ga a gap of 47 years, 47 years after Columbus's encounter with the Americas, the Bishop of Mexico, Juan de Sumaraga, introduced the first printing press in Mexico City. And the prelate's achievement antedated Boston's initial printing wor printed works by 100 years. Before long, there were a number of printing presses in Mexico. In the, for in the first century, you had only four presses. And then by uh, uh, 1761, there were six printing presses alone for Mexico City. And uh, I can make some other comparisons, but uh, in the uh, essence of time, I'll, I'll, I'll skip a, a lot of the data. In Spain, there was a printing, uh, not a printing firm, but a, but a book firm, Jacobo and Juan Cromberger, father and son. And they managed a very lucrative uh, monopoly in the book trade in 16th century Sevilla. Their firm annually shipped multiple crates of books to colonial Mexico some at the request of Bishop Zumarraga. The Kronbergers planted the seeds of literary, a literary tradition in Spanish North America. However, the social phenomenon that fomented the, pan, the antecedents of pamphleteering occurred in the last quarter of the 18th century with the proliferation of cartas, or postal communications. Cartas gained popularity among the reading public as the Spanish equivalent of chapbooks, but their coverage exceeded the peddler's hawking. In 20th century journalistic parlance, cartas were special editions or extras that summarized reports of major events received from distant lands. Andres de Alarcón Mendoza published the first carta in Madrid. The special editions that ran from 1621 to 1626 included snippets of news about the royal court, fashions, galas, brief accounts of droughts, earthquakes, famine, and deaths of ranking um, dignitaries transmitted by correspondents in the far-flung outposts of the Spanish Empire. 
the fledgling habit of the cartas gradually extended to Spanish America, where enterprising printers republished verbatim reports initially featured in the stylized Gaceta de Madrid. Before the end of the century, printers in colonial Mexico and elsewhere dropped cartas from the masthead and uh, introduced uh, relaciones uh, or descripciones. In the second half of the 18th century, another medium of information evolved in Spain and colonial Mexico, Sociedades Económicas de Amigos de País, and they soon dropped the Económicas, the, the descriptive uh, phrase there just became Sociedades de los Amigos del País, which would signify that they were operating within the law, that they were operating with the sanction of the crown. Now, these sociedades were unique in Spanish American society because both men and women assembled to read and discuss the latest books and pamphlets of mutual interest. The devotees gathered in candle-lit veladas, a vela is a candle, so they, they, they had candles and they called them veladas or tertulias. The latter term, tertulias, derived uh, from the, the name of a, an ecclesi Latin ecclesiastical writer, Quintus Septimus Florens Tertullianus of Carthage. At the tertulias, the guests discussed literary and scientific topics. The nomenclature of the assembly, society of friends of the country, reflected loyalty uh, to the government. It was the government that had given them, that had sanctioned these meetings, it had sanctioned the printed media from which then they took ideas for discussion. At least two decades before the culmination of Mexican independence, printing presses, pamphlets, and tertulias were commonplace in provincial capitals located in the central corridor of New Spain. And there you have then the geography. On the left, you have then the Sierra Madre of the West. On the east, the Sierra Madre of the East. And then uh, these mountain ranges were served as barriers, but they, the couriers found ways to either get through those barriers or go around them. In the first decade of the 19th century, Napoleonic armies invaded Iberia, paralyzed the, the government, and in the crisis, the Spanish Cortes that claimed legitimacy in the name of the absent monarch extended freedom of the press to loyalists in colonial Mexico, a concession that ultra-conservatives vehemently opposed. Meanwhile, the various chapters of the abbreviated Sociedades de Amigos del País continued the traditional and literary tertulias. At the start of the second decade, however, with Spain still in the grip of the Napoleonic invaders, secret cells called Los, Guadalup Los Guadalupes plotted to overthrow the royalist authority. Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla, rural pastor of Dolores, joined the literary and social club in nearby Querétaro to plan the insurgency against the Spanish crown. Hidalgo failed to achieve the goals of, this insur of the insurrection and ultimately paid the supreme penalty for inciting a rebellion. However, even as the fortunes of his revolt plummeted, he used a printing press to attract the import, or the, the, uh, the support, rather, of new partisans. A successor insurgent, also a priest, Jose Maria Morelos retrieved Hidalgo's fallen mantle of leadership. At one of his, uh, as one of his strategies, he accepted the support of Los Guadalupes, who contributed a printer and a printing press to the cause. On the threshold of independence, Agustin de Iturbide, a staunch royalist, who from the comfort of involuntary retirement discerned the moral rectitude of the insurgency. Late in 1820, he resolved to switch alliances or allegiances. At the summit in the remote sanctuary of Iguala, Iturbide consulted with rebel chieftain Vicente Guerrero. The two leaders drafted and endorsed a plan of Iguala, the concepts of which Iturbide reduced to three compact guarantees, independence, religion, and equality. Subsequently, Hidalgo, uh, excuse me, Iturbide appropriated a printing press to reproduce multiple editions of the proclamation to recruit new adherents. 
Unlike initial rebellious leaders who haphazardly distributed printed pamphlets, Iturbidi carefully selected towns that encircled Mexico City, <coughs> then dispatched couriers with bundles of the plan of Iguala to those locations and waited for the propaganda to soften the objectives within municipal limits. Unlike Miguel Hidalgo, who a decade earlier at Monte de las Cruces had attempted to seize control of the entrance uh, to, uh, las, um, at Monte de las Cruces, attempted to get an entrance into Mexico City by force of arms, on September 27, 1821, Agustin de Iturbide and his generals rode triumphantly as liberators into, quote, this most noble city. Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana of the coastal region of Veracruz became an early supporter of Agustin de Iturbide. Admittedly, Santa Ana shrewdly negotiated two promotions in short order. As a royalist captain, he courageously fought bandits and rebels in the rural countryside. On March 23rd, 1821, he pursued a band of insurgents into the town of Orizaba. And from their defensive bastion, the rebels boldly invited him to join their ranks. And Santa Ana responded with a heavy barrage from within the, sort of the fortified convento that he had commandeered. In the pre-dawn hours of March 29th, Santa Ana led a royalist contingent in a surprise attack upon the rebel partisans, capturing horses, munitions, and supplies. Then they returned to their convento stronghold. They retreated into this convento. And during the daylight hours, the rebels highly reinforced and advanced upon the convento, but they did not storm uh, then the, the religious community. In the early afternoon, serious negotiations began. In his coat pocket, Santa Ana held a bargaining a memorandum, namely a royalist promotion to the grade of Lieutenant Colonel, awarded by General Jose Davila for winning victories against rebel forces. At two o'clock, the rebel commander, Jose Joaquin de Herrera, bestowed upon Santa Ana the rank of full colonel as a reward for switch switching allegiance. For the next seven months, Santa Ana routinely patrolled the coastal slope as military commander of Veracruz. But he wasn't allowed to, to command the, co the port city. By October 18th, Royalist General Davila, who had taken refuge in the island fortress of San Juan de Uloa, surrendered. By that date, the insurgents in Veracruz province knew for certain that Agustin de Iturbide had entered Mexico City in splendor. By January 1822, Santa Ana returned to his hacienda as military com commandant of all of the province of Veracruz. Meanwhile, in less than a year, Iturbide's partisans had manipulated events that resulted in his designation as Agustin I, Emperor of Mexico. A regency, an important brace of empire, functioned as an administrative apparatus. In May 1822, the Regency summoned Santa Ana to Mexico City to clasp on his epaulets the covenant insignia of Brigadier General. The star that fell upon Santa Ana's epaulet designated him as the youngest officer of general denomination. I was uh, most appreciative uh, to the um, organizing committee who uh, gave us a, a, a tag yesterday uh, with a star. And uh, I, I like, uh, they put my, the, the star for my, my tag here at the bottom. And uh, I, I was glad I didn't tell him that, but uh, I'm glad that they did it. Because uh, I understand there was a, a, some propaganda, maybe a pamphlet, that was distributed and said that about this uh, conference, that there would be two grand old men and three rising stars in Texas <laughs> history. And I got a phone call. I said, which one are you? I said, I'm a rising star. <laughs> you see, I, I still have to reach that, that height. I'm, I'm working. So I, I like that because uh, the star is in, uh, at the base, and not, not at the top. Well, the, sun, the stars fell on Santa Ana, and he never was the same again. I once had a conference one time, and it was, it was, a, it was a, a Methodist bishop, one of the speakers. And uh, his wife was in the audience, and then during luncheon, I said to her, um, Madam, uh, there is an axiom that um, bishops, generals, and deans
Christians are not ordinary mortals. <laughs> and she said, what did you say, my dear? I said, bishops, generals, and deans are not ordinary mortals. She said, you're quite right. <laughs> so I talked to colonels. I talked to colonels very comfortably. With generals, I have to say, sir, general, you look like you were a general. You were. Oh, you, you should have been. <laughs> well, the, wh what happened then very quickly in Mexican history, uh, Santa Ana never allowed uh, political philosophies to, uh, to cloud his uh, thinking. Uh, he, he, would, he was a, an observer. He was, a, some have said, uh, uh, an opportunist. Uh, he, um, he allowed those delegates who went to the, after Itobidi fell, to went to a constituent congress in Mexico City to hammer out a constitution. It came out as a Federalist Constitution of, of 1824. When uh, he was pressed for, to give a response to what he favored, he said that he uh, favored uh, uh, constitutional principles. And they didn't know what they, he meant by that. So they in, construed that to mean he was in favor of a federal republic. Um, but uh, he stayed I I I on the periphery. He did not get involved in the arena uh, of debate. So the, in 1824, with a constitution now hammered out, uh, then candidates uh, then competed for the presidency. And an insurgent general by the name of Felix Fernandez entered uh, the presidential sweepstakes with a new name, Guadalupe Victoria. I guess with the name Felix Fernandez, he never would have won. <laughs> but Guadalupe Victoria, then he won. And uh, he uh, achieved the distinction as the only chief executive to serve the full four-year term. And during the interval, Santa Ana had remained apolitical, but politically motivated. And then two foreign diplomats introduced Masonic lodges as partisan clubs. The British minister, Henry George Ward, uh, formed the um, Scottish Rite Lodge called Los Escoceses for the Centralists. And then the American minister, Joe Roberts Poinsett, founded the York Rite Lodge for the, or Los Yorkinos, for the Federalists. In Veracruz, Santa Ana leaned uh, heavily, favorably, toward the Yorkinos, but his family interest then pulled him back uh, toward the Escocese side. But uh, he preferred to be ambivalent. And uh, in the presidential campaign of 1828, two Yorkinos then competed. Central, although he was a centralist, but he said he was a Yorkino. Manuel Gomez Pedraza, who was the incumbent Minister of War and Navy, and the Federalist Vicente Guerrero. And Santa Ana endorsed the later candidate, but he was still in Veracruz province, mainly because he endorsed Guerrero because the other candidate had offended him, the Minister of Army and uh, uh, War and Navy. The minister offended Santa Ana by not recognizing his exalted rank as commandant of Veracruz. See, generals are not ordinary mortals. They have to be um, honored. Well, Pedraza, as the interim uh, office holder, manipulated the army uh, to uh, influence the voting of the state legislatures in favor of his candidacy. candidacy and uh, there were 21 states, there were four territories, only the state legislatures then could cast votes. It would be like the Electoral College, and so there would be one vote per state. And the army then influenced just 11 legislatures. That's all you needed to do, you forget the other 10. So el 11 votes gave the presidency to Gomez Pedraza. Infuriated by the fraud, the Federalist supporters of the losing candidate tore the fabric of the Constitution by resorting to armed revolt to evict Gomez Pedraza from Mexico. And parenthetically, I might say that the American minister soon became persona non grata because then he came out and he was flying then the American flag, encouraging then the Federalists to, 
to the supporters of, of Vicente Guerrero uh, to, to achieve their victory. Uh, that only, that uh, relationship only lasted one year after Guerrero was gone, then so was Joel Roberts Poinsett. But he did contribute something to American folklore. Uh, he was a botanist and he appreciated the beautiful Noche Buena. And uh, he took some cuttings and then brought him back. You remind me of Madame Lafarge. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I keep feeling the guillotine is gonna fall on me. <laughs> uh, the, he brought back that, that the cuttings which then he cultivated in his greenhouse in, in, at home in Charleston. And, and soon he entered them in a, in a uh, botanical contest, gave a scientific name, the, the uh, Poinsettia Pulchirima. And uh, in the December, then you see the nurseries promoting the poinsettias. But nowhere do they have a picture of Joel Roberts' poinsett as being the one. You know, they, we, we ought to, we educators, we school teachers need to do this. Go out there and distribute pictures of poinsett to all these nurseries in our communities and say it's part of a m international relations here and goodwill. By, at, by the end of 1829, um, the centralists used the same tactic that the federalists had used in 1828 and uh, the, the Centralists then rebelled against uh, Vicente Guerrero and assassinated him. And then in 1830, the Vice President, who was a Centralist, uh, the, uh, the um, General Anastasio Bustamante, then uh, took uh, to wearing the presidential um, sash. By 1829, Santa Ana's demeanor gradually changed. Uh, at first, he was satisfied that the, his friend Vicente Guerrero had uh, become president. But he didn't like, he disagreed, he disapproved strongly of the tactical decision to allow then the centralist Anastasio Bustamante to become vice president. And Anastasio Bustamante had been the, the running mate of the ousted uh, uh, Gomez Pedraza, who, was, who went to live in Europe. And apart from launching a pronunciamiento in support of Guerrero, Santa Ana remained over in his province of what now is called a state in Veracruz. And four years later, his critics excoriated him for not defending Gomez Pedraza as the legitimately elected president of Mexico. They didn't say anything about him in 1828. They didn't write uh, pamphlets. Uh, uh, chastising him. No, they waited four years and, and then they chastised him. Well, during that one year that, that Vicente Guerrero was president, a Spanish flotilla sailed from Cuba and staged an amphibious landing near the port of Tampico on July 16, 1829. And news of this daring invasion reached down to Veracruz and motivated Santa Ana to act with dispatch. He didn't wait for Mexico City then to send him orders to tell him what to do. He decided what to do. He commandeered all the foreign ships in the harbor of Veracruz. He compelled the porteño merchants to contribute a loan of 20,000 pesos. And he ordered the improvised armada to transport the infantry to the battle site. Then he led the cavalry up the coast to Tampico. And although greatly outnumbered by the invaders, Santa Ana's leadership reflected boldness, imagination, and courage. Tropical storms near the Louisiana coast wrecked one of the Spanish transports. The other ships disembarked the troops on the beach south of Tampico in a pocket of infect infectious yellow fever. Initially, Santa Ana deployed the tools of diplomacy to persuade the Spaniards to withdraw. Then he applied the accoutrements of force to compel General Isidro Barradas to surrender on September 11th, 1829. A victorious Santa Ana extended magnanimity to the vanquished, allowing them to withdraw with dignity and honor. And he provided medical attention to the wounded, allowing them to remain until they, could, they had recovered and then they would find their way to Cuba. 
The victory at Tampico catapulted Santa Ana into an arena's reserve for national heroes. A grateful President Guerrero bestowed a promotion to general of division, together with a ceremonial belt appropriate to the elevated rank. Subsequently, the Congress accorded to Don Antonio the extraordinary designation of Benimerito de la Patria, meritorious servant of the country. Between the presidential campaign of 1828 and the defeat of the Spanish forces at Tampico in 1829, Santa Ana emerged out of the shadows of ambivalence and into the sunlight of pamphleteering. For months, Santa Ana thrived in the warmth of the prestige and acclaim derived from the congressional tribute as Benimerito de la Patria. And through the tumultuous fa uh, phase of public disapproval of General Anastasio Bustamante, who in 1820, had uh, rather 1829, in, in, had usurped presidential authority by virtue of, a, a, uh, of an assassination of Vicente Guerrero, Santa Ana remained uh, aloof from the controversy. The contentious law of April 6, 1830, which we know so well here in Texas, uh, designed to stem the flow of immigration from the United States, split public opinion in East Texas between Bustamantistas and Santanistas. In Veracruz, Santa Ana waited for the uproar against Bustamante to escalate before he committed himself to the opposition. By the summer of 1832, the pronunciamiento in his favor, there were several, propelled Santa Ana to endorse the sanctity of the Federalist Constitution of 1824. He alleged that Bustamante had dishonored this Constitution by usurpation of power. Santa Ana supporters distributed a pamphlet advocating law and order. Why such action, they asked? Because the public demands it. Quote, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, animated by a fiery patriotism and obedient to the impulses of charity, aware of similar sacrifices of his countrymen and responding to the will of the nation, which has chosen him as caudillo and redeemer, has determined to end the misfortunes of the towns. Carrying before him the pronunciamiento of Veracruz, regardless of the obstacles that are cast in his pathway. Swept by the rhetoric of an anonymous writer, the text elevated Santa Ana above St. Ignatius of Loyola, founder of the Compañía de Jesús, the Society of Jesus, because of his zeal for the welfare of human beings. The pronunciamiento that influenced Santa Ana's decision to oppose Antonio, Antonio Anastasio, rather, Bustamante emanated as a pamphlet dated July 5th, 1832, from the garrisons of Veracruz and of the Rock Island Fortress of San Juan Uloa. Capping the victory at Tampico, the pronunciamiento of Veracruz included the expulsion, they used the word expulsion rather than the conveyance of those Spaniards who had stayed behind the wounded from the Battle of Tampico. There were 60 of them, they sent them Instead of to Veracruz, uh, from out of Veracruz to New, excuse me, instead of from Veracruz to New Orleans rather than to Havana, Cuba, and they went aboard uh, uh, the uh, commandeered brigantines. You had Aguascalientes, Alto, the Tamesi, and a, and a schooner uh, named the Shark. A provocative footnote for the future Texas campaign in this pamphlet was the cryptic disappearance of Colonel Joaquin Ramirez y Sesma, assigned to the ministerial division of Tamaulipas, who had been implicated in the disreputable assassination of General Vicente Guerrero. A Bustamantista partisan warned the centralists that they had only two choices, to support the government in power or to thrust the nation into hell. Santa Ana's legions of rabble-rousers, they said, would destroy the country. To restore legitimacy to the 1824 Constitution, Santa Ana proclaimed that Manuel Gomez Pedraza, then residing in Europe, was the duly elected president of Mexico. However, 
he did not exhort his followers to annihilate Anastasio Bustamante, who, after all, was a brother general. The Bustamantistas taunted Santa Ana. Where is the hero of Sempoola, conqueror of Tampico, first general of the Republic, second Napoleon of the world, the one and only of Mexico, father of the towns, the liberator, the valiant, the wise, the never all powerful Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. They wanted to get him out of his hiding place. To answer his critics, Santa Ana in rapid order arranged for Gomez Pedraza to return to Mexico and to serve out the remaining four months of his expiring presidency. Upon returning to Mexico in December 1832, General Gomez Pedraza distributed a lengthy pamphlet reviewing the circumstances that culminated in his exile in 1828 and the state of affairs that per permitted him to return so late in the year. He came back so late that it was impossible to organize a meaningful agenda of government. And during the interregnum, Santa Ana dually posed as a Federalist and ardent champion of the Constitution of 1824. Accordingly, he campaigned for the presidency, together with Dr. Valentin Gomez Farrias for vice president. And six months after the inauguration, Santa Ana's partisans disseminating a stirring pamphlet condemning the defection of a few faint-hearted soldiers, but extolled the virtues of troops who remain loyal in the defense of Puebla. We march to render assistance to those brave sons of Puebla who have been guided by the heroes of perseverance. It cannot be said that we have abandoned them to chance, those valiant men who have inscribed in their hearts death or liberty forever. Soldiers, the cause which we defend is holier than all other causes. It is the national existence of liberty, of civilization. In the cause of arms, why do you repair with your deeds the scandals which others created by forgetting how much they owe to the country, to the honor of the national symbols, and to themselves? Soldiers, the pathway to glory is wide open. Let us march through it until peace is assured to the Republic. When the action is graced with glory, when it is in possession of the benef benefits, our name will be repeated from mouth to mouth, greeting us saviors of independence, of liberty, and of the Federation. In that transition between 1832 and 1833, Santa Ana finessed the subtleties in performance, adroitness, and skill in utilizing the pamphlets as media, in denouncing critics, and in advancing the goals in public policy that he favored. The abundance of pamphlets in the Mexicana collection at the Sutro Library will require keen eyesight and insight in selecting documents and arranging them in sequence to discern patterns in content and literary style. In many cases, anonymity of authorship is a shield pamphleteers use to conceal their identity. In other cases, the pamphlets are incomplete, leaving the researcher to ponder not only the author or authors of the printed text, but also the content of the missing passages and the historical context in which they were composed. Santa Ana's role as a pamphleteer is replete with questions. Was he the actual author of the pamphlets which his full name and rank appear at the conclusion? Uh, or did he have a press agent on his staff to distribute the materials in a timely manner? One characteristic about the pamphlets became evident in my study. Santa Ana's pronunciamientos were pithy, precise, and brief, suggesting he knew his audience, and he desired for his readers to remember his words and to tra transmit the message in the oral tradition to loyal partisans unable to read. Santa Ana's critics, on the other hand, produced pamphlets that were marathons and polemical argument. 
The value of the critics' tirades is that they often contained an historical context that inspired a response. Santa Ana's role as a pamphleteer before the Texas campaign serves as an indicator of how he mastered the medium to cultivate the loyalty of partisans. More importantly, it serves as a prism of lights and shadows in an effort to perceive Santa Ana's oratorical gifts in an arena surrounded by throngs of admirers, both civilians and soldiers. With limited temporal resources and even shorter spans of time to confront crises, how else can his leadership and ability to recruit thousands of troops for campaigns near and far be explained? Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, soldier, president, pamphleteer, country gentleman, and actor, was definitely good theater. Muchas gracias y muy buenas tardes. <laughs>